Manchester native, longtime resident of London, Howard Jacobson's career as novelist, critic, columnist, and television broadcaster goes back more than three decades. Though occasionally dubbed the English Philip Roth, Jacobson, who has said he would prefer the title the Jewish Jane Austen, <laughs> had published 10 acclaimed novels before last fall, including The Mighty, Mighty Waltzer, The Making of Henry, and 2006 Kaluki Nights. The Globe and Mail's Michael Posner called that novel a brilliant, raucous, ribald romp through the world of contemporary Britain, and speculated that, quote, Kaluki Nights is probably the most Jewish novel ever written. In October 2010, Howard Jacobson's 11th work of fiction, the Finkler question overcame 12 to 1 odds to win the Man Booker Prize. At age 68, Jacobson told a newspaper after the ceremony, I've been discovered. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Howard Jacobson. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. I've always thought of Toronto as one of the great literary cities, uh, uh, where you have one of the great literary festivals that has never invited me, by the way. <laughs> But this makes up for it all. I'll just read you a little bit. Uh, reading shouldn't go on too long. The, um, but I have to just set it up very briefly. Um, the novel essentially is the story of a friendship between three men. I'm going to read you a little bit about the third um, and the oldest of the men. His name is Libor Sevchik. He's a, he's a, he's, he was born in Czechoslovakia. Um, he was a teacher. He taught the other two men. The other two men are a young, lot younger than he is. Um, and after a brief career in, in teaching, he became a show business journalist, working in Hollywood and knowing, numbering Marilyn Monroe and Sophia Loren among his personal friends, in the course of which he, ha he, he has remained faithful to a wife of 60 years. The wife has just died. Libor, aged 90, is heartbroken. Um, the novel is partly the story of this heartbro heartbreak. He is balanced in the novel by another widower, Finkler, um, uh, and a man in the middle called Julian Treslove, who envies both these men the fact of their widowerhood. He's, he is, uh, there's, there's, no, no, there's no plumbing the depths of what a man might envy in his, in his friends. But what he, what he actually envies is the depth of their feeling for their ex-wives, and he would love to have that feeling. He would also love to mourn because he is a person that looks forward to mourning in life. This is a novel actually about mourning. Libor, aged 90, a man of immense energy for all that he is 90, and because of that energy, missing his wife uh, with, a great, with, with great profundity and sorrow, his friends are anxious about him and arrange for him to go out with a younger woman. His wife, by the way, because his wife's name crops up, is Malky, was Malky. What's your favorite color, the girl asks. M uh, Mozart. <laughs> and your star sign? My eyesight? Your star sign, your star. Oh, a star, Jane Russell. <laughs> so had begun Libor's first date of his widowhood. The girl, she must have been in her late thirties, but that still made her a girl to Libor, did not appear to know who Jane Russell was. Libor wondered where the problem lay in the accent he had not quite lost or the hearing he had not quite kept. It was beyond his comprehension that Jane Russell could simply be forgotten. Russell, he spelt out, R-U-S-S-E-L-L, -S -L, Jane, J-A-N-E, beautiful big. <laughs> he did the thing men do or the thing men used to do weighing the fullness of a woman's breasts in front of him like a merchant dealing in sacks of flour. His date for the evening looked away. She had no chest to speak of herself, <laughs> Libor realized, and must therefore have been affronted by his mercantile gesture. Though if she'd had a chest, she might have been more affronted still. The things you had to remember with a woman you hadn't been married to for half a century. The feelings you had to take into account. A great sadness overcame him. He wanted to be laughing with Malky over it. And then I said, 
Libor, you didn't. I did, and then I... Libor, you didn't. I did. Libor sighed, wanting it to be over, and showed the girl his hands. The flesh, disfigured with liver spots, was loose enough for her to slide her fingers under. It would peel clean away like the skin on a lightly roasted chicken. His knuckles were swollen, his fingernails dull and yellow, and bent over at the ends. Then he ran his hands over his baldness and inclined his head. He'd always been a balding man. Balding had suited him, but he was plucked clean by time now. The patina of extreme old age was on him. He wanted her to see her own reflection in his head, measure all the time she had left in the dull mirror of his antiquity. He could tell she couldn't figure out what he was showing her. When he used to present his bald head to Malky, she would polish it with her sleeve. <laughs> it used to excite her, not just the head, but the act of polishing it, as though he were her furniture. And it amused him to be her furniture. You can open my drawers whenever you like, he would say. <laughs> and she would laugh and cuff him with her sleeve. At the end, when she was dying in front of his eyes, they had talked dirty to each other. It was their defense against pathos. She wanted him to laugh because they had laughed so often together. Laughter had been his most precious gift to her. And now, at the last, she wanted laughter to be her final gift to him. I'm sorry, he told the girl, calling for the bill. This isn't fair to you. She was as relieved as he was when they parted. That's it. Thank you. Howard, uh, Woody Allen once famously said that the problem with writing comedy is that you don't get to sit at the grown-ups table. <laughs> Has winning the Booker changed that? Well, I always felt I was the grown-ups table. I always felt everybody else was sitting somewhere else with the kiddies. But it's made, yes, I mean, wh wh what you say is correct. It's made a huge change. It's, I think what it's done is it's given confidence to a lot of people who felt all along that what I was doing or what writers like me do was important and was neglected, really, in our times. We're going through, we have been going through a period in literature when, when comedy has been undervalued, which is strange because in, right. in, in Britain and in this country, I'm sure, too, there's an enormous value, a high valuation on comedians. But that's as long as they're being comedians. The comedian is a comedian and we know where we are, but the minute the novelist is some sort of a comedian, then everything gets thrown and it's been... My being, my being what's called a comic writer, which is a title that, as you can imagine, you know you're a writer, is exasperating. Somebody calls me a comic writer, I go, I'm not a comic writer, I'm a tragic writer. Somebody, somebody comes up to me and says, your Finkler question I was told was the first great comic novel to win the Booker Prize, but it's not comic, it made, it made me cry, and then I want to say, yes, but it was also, surely you found it funny as well, so no reader, no reader can get it right with me. Um, <laughs> Unless they can, in one quick sentence, which is more than I can do at the moment, balance, balance the two things, balance comedy and, and tragedy. You did attempt that sentence in a, in a conversation last fall where you said you want, if possible, for people to laugh and cry at the same sentence. At that same moment, yes. At that same moment. Yes. I mean, that is the most wonderful thing if you can do it. I used to, when I was first writing, and didn't quite have the confidence to move towards the tragic, but, but, but would touch it. Mm -hmm. Would write about despondency and despair and failure, of course, the great subject for any writer, failure. Um, Lots um, of personal experience. Yes, yes. yes, yes. yes. Um, and it's what <laughs> binds us. It's what brings us all together, because we are, as the crude world goes, failures. I know nothing about your individual lives, and I'm, lives, and I make no, I make no judgments upon them. How, how can I? But you're here because you're readers, and the fact that you're reading, the fact that you have a, a passion of some sort for art, must mean that somewhere or other, the, the world as its ordinary value is not sufficient for you. 
You do not feel you have prospered in this world, or you do not feel that this world gives you what you want. So as the world go, as the world of sportsmen and cricketers and footballers and baseball players and bankers and insurance men, there might be, there might be people here who are all those things, in which case forgive me. But as the valuation of, the, of that world goes, then you are not. You would not be considered successful. Successful people don't come to a library. <laughs> <laughs> to listen to a novelist talking about his books, about failure. So we are bonded. We are bonded in this idea. And we are also, we are the elect too, in that we also know that we, are, we, we enjoy success beyond the imaginings of those who, who think success is a merely material thing. So we are at once failures and uh, probably overproud successes. How did we get onto that? that well, was <laughs> In short, anxiety, disappointment, yes. failure, this is all yes. good comedic material. Yes, but we, you asked me a question, didn't you, about the, how the sent, how one moves from... It, yeah. the, the, the capacity of a single sentence to contain both tragedy and comedy. Yes. That, that for you, I think you said, would be the, is the ultimate, is, the, is, the, is your ambition. Yes. Well. At the moment when you... That, yes, I realise how I got there now. I, um, <laughs> And as I've, as I've got grown older and I hoped matured as a writer, then the ambition to move from comedy, to make someone yeah. laugh, to make you laugh and also to make you feel something else at the same time, uncomfortable and feel the opposites. You know, any, any, any writer and any lover of a writer knows all this, knows that wonderful moment, that churn in your stomach or that twist in your mind when you move from something that you think is funny and maybe it's light and maybe it's just a joke and then it's not just a joke and then it's serious and if it's serious, where are we? Because that's a terrible thought to have and that pleasure we take in a sentence that's got comedy in it, which is often a pleasure in language, a word we've not heard like that used before, you know, that surprise that we get, that we get in writers like Dickens, the great novelist, where we just, we, it's Shandy. on a roller coaster, yeah. isn't it? Yes, absolutely. You, uh... <laughs> Would you consider it a failed night if you didn't make people laugh tonight? Hmm. Yes, I say to my wife, if, I've, if we've had an evening and it's some, things have got somehow rather very literary or very solemn, solemn right. um, and I, 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 I will say to my wife afterwards, well, that was, that, was, that was no good. And she said, but it was terrific. I was sitting in the audience. People all, all around me were listening t intently. And I said, but they didn't laugh. And she said, but they don't have to laugh all the time. And I know in myself that there is more than one kind of laughter. You don't have to laugh aloud. There's a quiet laugh. There is an appreciation of comedy that doesn't, that doesn't have to emit a noise, but I am a junkie on the noise of laughter. I have, to hear, I, have to, I have to hear it. And when I'm writing, I don't know what it's like for you, but when I'm writing, I have to, I have to imagine. I write sentences no, feeling that these are sentences that could be delivered and performed and heard as they're performed. And I have to imagine that, that an audience will be, you know, gasping or responding or somewhere. James Joyce famously laughed while working by himself and his wife, Nora, would say, Jim, would you ever shut up? Uh, <laughs> do you laugh? I do, I do sometimes laugh. Yes, yes I, do some, I do sometimes laugh. And I, but as I've grown older, I find the other thing that's happening is I'm making myself much sadder. I cry. I cried several times in the writing of this novel. You hope nobody will spot, you know, it's a very strange sight. It must be. Um, to see somebody working away at his computer, which is how I work with the tears rolling down his cheek, making yourself cry is a very strange thing to do for a living. Um, <laughs> but I do it. But I'm not sure, you know, I mean, who, do, who does the writing? You know, when we write, you must have this feeling. The great thing about writing, the reason why I think everybody, should, everybody who might not write should write, whether they're any good at it or not, is to feel what it's like to feel yourself, give your, yourself, the self that you know about, um, the self that, the articulating self, give way before something that you don't know about. Uh, some, is it mysterious or what is it? That sense you have of somebody else, of somebody else writing. So that you're, sometimes you fit, who's making this happen? Things happen in the Finkler question that I didn't know were going to happen. I didn't know Libor was going to go on a date. Things happen to Libor that I didn't know. Libor does it. 
Libor does. So it's Libor, Libor that's making me cry. It's not me that's making me cry. It's Libor that's making me cry. And the great thing, I think, about art, any kind of art, is that it is the making of it or the receiving of it, is that it, it takes us into some realm that's better than our conscious merely thinking and worse of all merely opinionating selves we spend so much time having opinions on the internet twittering and wittering and <laughs> facebooking and i think this and i think that as though it's important what we think and the better the better more creative self doesn't have a that doesn't is beyond all those thoughts we are we are boring when we when when we just have thoughts when we have opinions we are at our worst as a so i seem to have hit a preacher mode no. <laughs> It got me in a, I mean, I'm, I was standing there and feeling at, at the pulpit. It was the, it was the Jane Austen analogy, maybe, that got you yeah, out of this yeah, direction. Yeah, that's what did. The, uh, for myself, I sense that work is going well when, when I don't have much control at all over what the characters are saying or doing. And when time vanishes, do you find your workday just sort of disappears on you when you're in a, a nice zone of work? Yes, and isn't that wonderful when that happens? Isn't yes. that terrific? Yes, you do. And you too, you don't, suddenly it's four o'clock and you do. It's usually a good sign for me, yes, that hours have gone by and, and you look down at the page and you, 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 you had no intention of going that, taking that turn in the work. Yeah, isn't that wonderful? And that's when, so when you said who's writing the books, who is writing your books when, uh, in the, during those moments? Well, of course, it is oneself. Right. It cannot be anybody but oneself. But it's the oneself that one allows that one opens doors to or something, so that maybe everything that you've ever heard, maybe somewhere or other there are channels through which everything that you've ever heard and everything that you've ever read can, can, can return to you in another form. But it's not just the, you that has the will to make a thing happen. I've, I know some writers who, who will tell you what their books are going to be, and some painters too, who will tell you what their paintings are going to be, and they possess their work with an iron will, it's going to be this. It's never any good like that. <laughs> a, a, a friend that I started off writing with, and he never made it happen, and I, it took me long enough, God knows, but I did make it happen, and he had wall charts. And he would start his novels with wall charts, and I would say, well, what are those? He said, well, that's the novel. I have to know when everybody's, but I never know when anybody's, I have to be highly edited, because I send in things and the editor goes, but that's impossible. <laughs> Somebody's fallen in love with somebody here who's about 400 years older than them. That's not possible. And I go, well, clear that up. That's not what's important. Whereas my friend with the wall chart knew where everything was. And, knew, so, and you, if you know where everything begins, then you know where everything's going to end, in which case you're holding your work like that. And the great work, I think, not for me to say that my work is great work. You can say it, but I can't say it. <laughs> But the great work is done, you must know this, with lo loose, with in, in, in cricket they talk about the best batsman playing with loose hands. Yes, yeah. You know, and many sports must be like that. Any, any, any time you catch it, any game that involves catching, you have to have, you have, to have loose hands. And I think the, the making of art is like that too. You must possess the work. Loose. I don't know if it's different. You write biography, and I've never done that. I don't know. That. Is that an entirely different discipline? More craft than, than perhaps what we're talking about here. There's more hard, relentless craft, I found. But I also have written novels. So yes. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of that now, and that experience, or that uh, 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 journey, which is... Uh, that's why I, I jumped on your, your remark, who's writing the book, because it is, can be oddly out of body. Yes. The, the, the creative moment. As you get older, is, is that becoming easier or harder? It's becoming easier and easier to let go. Okay. Because I find now that I don't have to worry that there won't be anything written. Before it was, I've got to move it along. I've got to move it along. There is no book unless you move it along. And now I've grown, I mean, I've now written, this is my 11th novel. I'm now writing my 12th, and I've written four works of nonfiction. So, well, you've written many yourself. So you have two seasoned, two seasoned writers. So what's that? 25 books between us? There is nothing we don't know about the writing of books. You've written that many. Ask us anything. Anything, absolutely anything. <laughs> uh, anything. Well, it was, well ask, us, ask him anything. And, and I find it now, you know, I, I do now at last feel confident that something will, something will write itself and sitting in front of an empty page is not a problem. It's quite a good thing. And there, lo and behold, this wonderful thing happens. You have a thought. You have a thought, where's that thought come from? You know, that you f at first when that happens, I used to feel a fraud. 
But I don't think that. I've just put something down and it looks like a pearl of wisdom. Wisdom. I don't have wisdom, and I don't have that wisdom. Where does it come from? And that, that happens more and more now. It's thought, not just a character doing something that I didn't know the character was going to do, but they express a thought. I mean, a really big thought. And it appears to be their own and not yours. Yes. Isn't, yes. That, isn't that something? That's the most fantastic thing. Yeah. It is the most fantastic appears, thing. It's theirs, yes. even though, yes. to all intents yes. and purposes, yes. you, you wrote it. Absolutely the most fantastic thing. Yeah. And here is the, great, the greatest justification of art, the escape from the self, the, the tyranny of the self, the, limited the making narrows, of art. You, yes. Right, into that larger. Yes. Which in the case of this room is all about failure and disappointment. And of course it is, all ignominy, shame, humiliation, <laughs> all those things that bind us. I know that Howard would enjoy hearing some of your stories uh, along those lines when he's signing books yes, afterwards. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you'd like to share. You mentioned we could have two line. We could have a people who are people who've got nothing that they need to confess line and we can move along. I can sign those with my left hand and then with my right hand we can have tales of ignominy and shame. And then we could save for later on when all that's done perhaps half a dozen people could stay back for tales of gross humiliation. <laughs> that's a wee hours thing isn't it I think. That's a late night thing. Yes, yes. yes. We meet at a bar and talk about that. <laughs> 